top story today, Square announcing last night that it has acquired Afterpay in a $29 billion deal. All stock transaction bringing Square deeper into the buy now or really bringing it into the buy now pay later space. Square also out with its uh, earnings results last night. Shares up about 4% in early trading at last check. Joining us now to talk about this deal and everything else going on in the fintech space, Mark Palmer, managing director and analyst over at BTIG. So Mark, uh, let's just start with your first reaction when you saw the news last night uh, that Square going out using their stock uh, to make a splashy acquisition. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, this deal makes a lot of sense uh, for Square, especially insofar as it enabled the company to expand significantly, both in terms of product line uh, and globally, um, by using its stock as an acquisition currency. Um, buy now, pay later uh, is an interesting space. Um, it's an online payment method through which uh, consumers can pay for items and in installments. It has really taken off during the pandemic. Uh, if anything, Square was a, a bit late to the game uh, in this regard. You've got a lot of uh, established players out there, Klarna, Affirm. You have others uh, such as PayPal, uh, Amex, who have uh, gotten into the space. You know, so uh, Square, uh, this was a bit of a departure from their typical approach, which is to uh, innovate organically, uh, but they really need to catch up and, and this enabled them to do that. Mark, you also cover PayPal, and I see the shares down about about one near oh, about one percent here in, in the early going. Uh, what does this acquisition mean to the competitive environment? And if you own PayPal shares, should you be concerned about the moves that Square continues to make? I don't think so. You know, I, I think that frankly, uh, PayPal is a behemoth within the fintech space. Uh, they have multiple avenues uh, uh, for revenue growth. Buy now, pay later is something that uh, PayPal did build organically, and they've already grown it to uh, a very significant size. If anything, we think that PayPal's growth uh, did put some pressure on Square in that regard. But, but bigger picture, you know, who is Square thinking about as they're doing this? It's not so much PayPal. It's really others like Stripe, you know, which is a giant in terms of online payment processing. And we've seen uh, increasing uh, overlap between what Square is doing and what Stripe is doing. So I, I think more along those lines. The other thing is that uh, if Square is looking to be able to compete with the likes of Visa and MasterCard with their card networks, they need to be able to grab more of the consumer's wallet uh, and do so as quickly as possible. This helps them to do that. Well, now you have Klarna out there, Mark. Last capital raise for them valued the company at $46 billion. If you're Klarna, do you sell out and who would be a buyer? Uh, well, I think if there, there's always the question about whether it's better to sell or simply to go the public route um, and, and let the, the market judge that. Um, frankly, uh, you know, a firm did go public uh, through a direct listing. Uh, its stock has not been a great performer, and, and that might help to inform Klarna's view in terms of, you know, who they would sell to. Uh, again, who are the big players who are out there, you know, in this space? You know, a good example of this is is American Express, you know, which which is uh, uh, doing this. Um, even Apple, you know, is involved in this game. So, you know, is it is it possible that uh, a Klarna, um, or for that matter, a firm, you know, which is public but but certainly could be taken over? Um, you know, could be part of consolidation. Absolutely. What we do anticipate, certainly, is that we are going to see much more consolidation in the fintech space going forward, and this is just starting. Yeah, you know, Mark, it's interesting you brought up some of those um, traditional uh, credit card issuers and obviously differences between, you know, the Amex network and Visa and so on and so forth. But I'm curious how, how you see those traditional players, let's say, that U.S. consumers are more familiar with fitting into this new world where buy now, pay later. I mean, every time I buy something online, it's an option. And uh, I, as our viewers know, I've used it. Sometimes it's actually not as good a deal as you would think. And just where that fits into kind of the consumer stack um, these days as, as online e-commerce, you know, obviously continues to gain share. Well, I think what we have seen is that buy now, pay later uh, tends to appeal to uh, budgets budget conscious younger consumers uh, who you know, typically um, are somewhat risk averse and, and prefer debit cards to credit cards as an example. And buy now, pay later is an alternative to using credit cards. Um, so it, it uh, 
definitely fits in that regard. That what, what's remarkable, if you look at uh, some of the cohort metrics coming out of uh, Afterpay, is uh, the, the amount of repeat business that these customers do. You know, in, in the case of uh, Afterpay, after a year, um, its customers are doing 11 times as much repeat business in, in, uh, in the cohorts they study. After four years, that goes up by 29 times. You know, so uh, this is clearly a means through which you can capture young consumers in particular, keep them on your platform, uh, and then the lifetime value of those customers increases dramatically. Um, so Square, in looking at that, is all about uh, increased engagement across its ecosystem, both its cash app and its seller ecosystem. Um, and, and this is one means through which they, they can really do that. And of course, this is uh, on top of the fact that Square has increased engagement on its own platform by about 40% year over year, where customers are transacting 18 times per month now. And there we see uh, on the screen Square shares uh, now up almost 8% in early trading. Uh, Mark, yesterday we also saw Square come out with its uh, pre-announcement of sorts, three days early, four days early, of its second quarter earnings. Um, curious how you saw uh, the second quarter for the company beating on the bottom line, a little light on the top line. What stood out uh, in those results? Well, I think it's important when you look at the top line to differentiate between uh, the operating business and then the operating business revenues plus Bitcoin. And I think that the numbers, uh, at, when you include Bitcoin, uh, were a bit down relative to expectations, um, but the core business revenues were actually higher. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, Bitcoin revenues were, were down quite a bit relative to analyst expectations. We think that this has everything to do with the fact that um, some of the enthusiasm for Bitcoin in particular, crypto in general, um, you know, waned so much, uh, somewhat uh, after we saw uh, the, the severe pullback in crypto in the third week of May that then extended from that. So um, you know, that's transitory. I mean, what, what we saw is that um, Bitcoin generated about uh, 55 million of gross profit for uh, Square during the quarter, that's down from 75 million in the uh, last quarter. Uh, it, it's not something that is uh, tremendously moving the needle for a company that is looking to do a run rate of about 4 billion of gross profit this year. Mark, you cover all the fun companies. I believe you also cover Coinbase here. From uh, Is there any read through on uh, from what Square had to say down quarter over quarter in terms of Bitcoin uh, revenues or crypto revenues? Any read through to what crypt, uh, Coinbase might report in a couple of days? Well, I think that, that uh, there's an understanding that uh, volumes in the crypto space in general uh, were down after, uh, again, the, the volatility that really picked up in the third week of May. And so there's an anticipation that even though Square's, uh, I'm sorry, Coinbase's second quarter results uh, will, will look quite strong. Um, you know, the impact of that uh, pullback really, you know, affected the last part of the quarter. The first couple of months were gangbusters for Coinbase. You know, I think uh, what, um, so I think that that is baked into a large extent. There's an appreciation understanding of where those volumes are. And those who follow Coinbase closely know they can go online and track uh, the company's volumes with uh, some accuracy. So I don't think there are a lot of surprises there. All right, we'll leave it there. Mark Palmer, Managing Director and Analyst over at BTIG. Mark, really appreciate you spending some time with us this morning. Thanks for jumping on. Certainly. All right, welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live on this Monday morning. But an interesting couple of months for the crypto space. We saw Bitcoin's rally last weekend, and now we see the price of the cryptocurrency sitting closer to 40000 here after having traded down towards 30000 during most of the month of July. And joining us now to talk about the state of uh, institutional adoption within the crypto space and sort of where the bull cycle is headed from here. Uh, we're joined by Raghu Yarlagada, the CEO at Falcon X. Raghu, thanks so much for jumping on this morning. Let's just start with um, how you think about uh, crypto as an institutional asset, especially, you know, we were just talking to an analyst about Square. We see Coinbase will be out with its results. On, on the back of a couple of major public companies, at MicroStrategy, so on and so forth, incorporating Bitcoin into where they sit. How does that change things um, for, for you guys on your, on your part of the business? Absolutely. First off, great to be here, Miles and Brian. So in terms of institutional adoption, uh, just to give you a little bit of context on the timeline, 
May 2020 is when we saw the flurry of U.S. institutions coming into uh, crypto, primarily around the narrative of uh, Bitcoin being a, a good inflationary hedge. As that happened, around November is when the diversification happened to uh, Asia and Europe. And around the January timeframe, uh, corporate treasuries, we began seeing a lot of corporate treasuries coming in. And uh, the core use case and the core narrative is what started as an inflationary hedge, diversified into stable coins. And now uh, there's a lot of focus around yield generation, especially around this macro regime of uh, world printing a lot of money. So to answer your question specifically, institutional demand over the last one month uh, you know, is cautiously optimistic. Uh, they are definitely uh, concerned about where or what is going to happen next, especially on the regulatory uh, front. But that being said, the new cycle around Amazon, the new cycle around yield generation through uh, different vehicles within crypto, that is definitely drawing a lot of attention. Specifically from Falcon X, we haven't seen uh, a drop in institutional customers coming in. Uh, we're seeing a very healthy inflow of traditional institutions coming up and signing up uh, to trade crypto. Raghu, when you say you have the inf institutions coming in and, and trading, uh, trading crypto right now, how would you define an institution? Is, are, is that a hedge fund? Oh, that's a great question. So we're seeing a very diverse set of uh, personas, Brian, all the way from some of the world's largest hedge funds, crypto native funds, retail aggregators, Neo banks and commercial banks. Right now, most of the activity is around the hedge funds and the prop shops. Raghu, I'm curious um, what you make of the stablecoin market now and, and what role that is playing. Because I think it, covering you know, US financial markets, basically equities, I see these stablecoin headlines. I, I don't worry too much about them. But from your you know, vantage point operating an exchange in this space, how do you know? How does Tether fit into um, you know creating a stable and and really trusted you know crypto institutional market at this point? Absolutely, a lot of U.S. Uh, traditional institutions who are coming into the space, they, we haven't seen a ton of their activity in Tether. They've been focused on USDC, the Circle stablecoin. Uh, some U.S. Institutional, uh, U.S. institutions and also quite a few of Asian institutions, they definitely do have exposure to Tether. But, Miles, I think the important point to note is while everyone is watching what's happening with Tether on the regulatory front, a lot of the exposure to Tether is very transactional or temporal. As the news cycle about Tether came in about two, three, four weeks back, a lot of institutions moved to USDC. And uh, some institutions came back, back again into Tether. So to answer your question, definitely Tether has a sizable role to play in the crypto macro uh, ecosystem. There's no question about it. But because of the transactional nature, I think crypto as an ecosystem is a lot more robust um, you know, around the new cycles uh, concerning Tether. And then also on the yield side, you know, certainly uh, big news that we saw last week out of FTX, and there's been a lot of um, conversation around just DeFi platforms and you know, yield farming, all of these kinds of, of ideas. And ha has that generated um, questions, concerns, interests uh, fr from your vantage point? And how do you see that sort of right-sizing? I mean, you, you get 0% lending basically in, in the US dollar market. How much longer till we see spreads compress you know, from the crypto side? Oh, that's a fascinating question, uh, Miles. There's a lot of conversations around yield generation through uh, decentralized finance. Specifically, the U.S. traditional institutions, I mean, in the regime of uh, commercial banks paying anywhere from 40 to 80 basis points of interest rate, um, on the DeFi side, they're seeing about 4%. And building on the DeFi momentum, Coinbase and Circle offered institutional treasury products that, you know, that generate about 4%. Uh, interest rate on an annualized basis. So that triggered, that stoked a lot of interest from the U.S. institutions uh, specifically. Now, as they come in, they want to understand the underlying mechanics. I mean, how are we generating 4% uh, yield? Part of it is uh, through the trading activity. Bitcoin volatility uh, generates a lot of demand for U.S. dollar for momentum traders to basically borrow. That is one source of yield generation. The second source of yield generation, which you're referring to, is around the decentralized finance through protocols like Compound and Aave. So right now, institutions are watching it very closely. Uh, they have a lot of questions, right? I mean, 
what's the soundness of the protocol, uh, they're getting comfortable. We see a lot of institutions touching uh, compound uh, through intermediaries uh, like us. And, uh, but at the same time, I wouldn't say that they are completely fully on board on the decentralized finance side because they're waiting for clarity on the regulatory side of things, Miles. And Raghu, I'm, I'm interested in, in your firm. Uh, last thing I saw, or last numbers that I saw, you raised $50 million uh, in March, uh, valued the company at $675 million. Are you back in the market trying to raise more capital? Do you want to IPO sometime this year? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of demand, uh, you know, coming from both traditional venture capitalists, hedge funds who are uh, looking into the crypto space and the broader tokenization narrative, and also crossover funds, uh, Brian. So there's a lot of inbound and we're having conversations uh, like any good firm that's growing incredibly fast. But at the same time, uh, like in a new announcement to make at the moment, we'll be, stay tuned. Uh, we're excited to be talking about that. A masterful way, having conversations. Love that, Raghu. We're all having conversations all the time, of course, right? About all sorts of things. Uh, I appreciate the time this morning. Raghu Yalagata, CEO of Falcon X. Raghu, uh, I'm sure we'll have you back. Thanks for jumping on. QuantumScape says it's making progress with getting its battery technology to market in a bid to supply the surging electric vehicle space. The company continues to target commercial production sometime in 2024. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is QuantumScape founder and CEO Jagdeep Singh. Jagdeep, always good to speak with you here. So we've been following uh, you from the very beginning. Where are you uh, in terms of a timeline in getting your technology to market? Yeah, morning, Mark. So the timeline hasn't changed. Uh, we, we've said, as you pointed out, uh, we want to commercialize in the 24, 25 timeframe, and that's still the timeframe that we're targeting. Uh, you know, what's I think what's encouraging is the results we announced last week uh, is that we, we seem to be uh, tracking well to that timeline. So if you recall, in December, we showed uh, what we called single layer cells. Those are the first uh, demonstrations of solid state batteries with, you know, one cathode, one anode, one uh, solid state separator. And then in February on the earnings call, we reported four layer cells, which is kind of stacking these up into bigger cells. And then, of course, last week we announced that we now have uh, 10 layer cells. Uh, and of course, that's a big deal because, you know, while the single layer cells demonstrate that the chemistry works and we can make these solid state cells and the performance is, you know, better than uh, than has ever been reported before. Uh, and, and starts to close the gap with combustion engines, we needed to stack those single layers up into multiple layers to make bigger cells. And, and that's the results that, that make us feel like we're, you know, we're uh, going to be able to hit our, our, our targets uh, in the 24, 25 timeframe to commercialize. Jackie, what you and your team do, uh, are now 400 employees, it's, it's not as simple as making a sandwich and putting on the grill here. Uh, what challenges are you up against in, in the near term here to reach your commercialization goal? Yeah, so, you know, um, as we stack more of these layers up together, one of the key things you need is just you need to have more uh, more material, more, you know, more more uh, uh, separators to, to work with. So we need to increase our capacity. That's a big part of what we're doing this year is we're ordering you know, bigger versions of the tools that we work with so we can get more capacity. Uh, obviously, we need to engineer the, the stacking itself. Uh, and it's not quite as simple as a sandwich, but uh, but it's not quite as hard as as fundamental new chemistry, which we which we already addressed, uh, you know, in the, in the December results that we showed. So uh, really, I would say the biggest task uh, going forward is, is around scale up and, and scale up is there's two ways to scale it up. There's uh, there's uh, scaling up the number of layers in a cell uh, that we've shown, you know, very encouraging progress on. Uh, and there's also a scaling up in terms of the capacity and throughput of the, the manufacturing facilities. And and there you might recall, uh, you know, we announced that we were doing this pre pilot line facility that should be able to produce you know, hundreds of thousands of cells in the 2023 timeframe, you know, which gives us enough cells to put into real test cars. And that's when I think you'll see actual cars with, uh, with these batteries in them. Now, Jagdeep, your, your timeline here gives you guys a, a little bit more leeway to work through some of the supply issues that, of course, we've all heard about across the economy. But I'm curious um, if you have had any challenges getting materials you need, uh, whether it is on the raw material side, whether it's on uh, some of the more technical input side, and if that has at all hampered your development or if, or if you're wary of, you know, you look out 12, 18 months, where that you could run into some of those bottlenecks. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, some of the some of the uh, tool suppliers that that we use, uh, these are you know large industrial tools used in many different industries, from ceramics to the battery industry. Uh, they have experienced some uh, uh, you know some uh, uh, delays based on their own supply chain. So obviously, things like the the worldwide semiconductor shortage is hitting some of these players. Luckily, the overall impact has not been too dramatic for us. We've been you know we, we've we've been placing our orders nine, twelve you know months in advance of. Uh, when the tools are scheduled to come in, so there's enough uh, working uh, margin there. Uh, but it's something that we, you know, we obviously track very closely. We have a great team of people that works with those suppliers. Uh, recall that Volkswagen is our our, uh, our biggest partner, and they obviously have a lot of you know buying power, and so they they've been actually uh, very helpful in helping us work with some of these suppliers. So overall, there has been you know uh, 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 you know uh, uh, small impacts on, on various tools, uh, but in the large uh, larger picture, we we feel like we're you know, we're, we're going to be able to uh, to um, uh, get to the targets that we're, uh, we're, we're shooting for. Jagdeep, I believe you're poised to deliver prototype samples to auto OEMs in 2022. Who will be getting those samples and what exactly are they getting? So you deliver a battery uh, to some of these OEMs, they test it out. What's the range on those batteries? Yeah, so by prototype samples, what we mean is samples that um, uh, are in the commercial form factor. Uh, so uh, we already are making cells that are that are in the commercial area, so commercially relevant area, I should say. Um, so it's you know close to what we think uh, we'll actually be shipping uh, to, to customers. Uh, but what we need to do is uh, have the number of layers also be consistent with what we will ship commercially. So uh, we've said that customers uh, are going to be getting on the order of a few dozen layers uh, of these single layer stack cells stacked up. Uh, sometime next year. That's still our target. Uh, the first customer to get these cells, of course, will be Volkswagen. Uh, we've, you know, we've uh, uh, made sure that they're the, our, you know, our biggest partner, uh, and and they will, uh, they're, they'll be the first uh, cars on the road with these cells. Uh, and then in 2023, that's when you will see, uh, you know, these cells go into actual test cars on on test tracks. Uh, so that's kind of the rough time frame. So these these prototype samples with, you know, multiple dozens of layers are targeted for next year. In 23, we see actual cars uh, with this technology, and then 24, 25 timeframe, if all goes well, uh, we hope to be in, in, in mass production. Also with Volkswagen, as you, as you might recall, we're doing a joint venture with them to manufacture these cells in volume. So when that happens, uh, that's when the full vision of what we're talking about you know, gets realized, which is, of course, you know, uh, cars or batteries that, that have a longer range, you know, faster charge times, uh, safer operations, you know, all those things come together with, with solid state batteries and, uh, and that's really what we're shooting for. Is your guidance still to hit 6.4 billion in sales by 2028? And if so, what is in that assumption? Is that just business related to Volkswagen? Yeah, so our numbers haven't changed at all. Those are the numbers we shared when we did our um, uh, our offering last year, and and you know we really haven't uh, uh, updated or changed those numbers at all. Um, basically, the the, the first uh, volume customer is going to be Volkswagen. Volkswagen has a lot of different brands, as you know, from Porsche to Audi to the VW brand itself. So a number of iconic brands. Uh, once they ship cars, uh, we are free to ship uh, with other players as well. Uh, the numbers you refer to are uh, a mix of both the VW facility as well as additional factories that we turn up uh, beyond uh, that first factory. So the, the VW factory uh, is what we expect will, will be in, in, in production in the 24, 25 timeframe. Uh, but post that timeframe, you know, 26, 27 or later, uh, we expect to have additional factories that will serve additional customers as well. And, and, uh, and that's what creates the, the, the really big opportunity here. And lastly, do you need to raise capital to ultimately push to, to develop that manufacturing footprint? Well, we've said that the cash we have in the bank, which is currently you know, around $1.5 billion, is sufficient to get us into production. Uh, and in fact, it'll also um, uh, contribute some capital to our subsequent um, uh, QS1 expansion plans. Um, and you know, uh, so so we're you know we 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 feel pretty good about our cash balance right now. It's really you know we we don't um, uh, we, we don't need additional capital to get to uh, to get into production. Uh, and so uh, we're focused really on execution. You know, getting this uh, you know, getting these layers done, getting the factories built, uh, and and, and uh, demonstrating that this technology actually you know uh, can uh, uh, be commercialized and, and, and make an impact on the EV market. All right, we'll leave it there. QuantumScape founder and CEO Jagdeep Singh, always good to see you. Stay safe. We'll talk to you soon. Pleasure, Brian. Thank you. 
pet care platform Rover is no longer just an app. The company is making its market debut today on the NASDAQ after merging with the SPAC, the ticker symbol ROVR. Joining us now to discuss Rover is CEO Aaron Easterly. Aaron, good to see you here. Congrats uh, on the debut here. I want to jump right into guidance here. We've seen the economy roar back. A lot more people are taking vacations. Are you still tracking to your 2021 guidance here of 3.9 million bookings and about 97 million in sales? We originally put together a projection as part of the SPAC process and the S4. We actually upped our guidance above and beyond that projection for 2021 because of the strength that we are seeing uh, in the year. So we're really excited about the progress today. Have you been able to find workers to support that better than expected growth? Uh, yes, uh, we're activating and bringing on uh, service providers. Uh, some of our service providers that were active during the pandemic have come back. But Rover is unique. Um, people can have a dog in their home and go about the rest of their life. They can be a stay-at-home parent. They can be a software engineer. Um, so doing Rover doesn't necessarily preclude you from doing other work that generates income as well, which is unique and different than a lot of companies. And, and Aaron, I'm curious how much the pet boom during the pandemic has, has reshaped the way that you guys are thinking about the business. Obviously, those initial you know, projections we're, we're looking for, let's say, a return to work in, in 22, and then obviously that's going to create increased demand. But I mean, are you guys seeing folks who are working at home still hiring a Rover Walker? And how does, how does just the, the boom and the number of pets out there change the way you think about some of your opportunities? Uh, the first is the opportunity is bigger. Um, the annual growth rate in pet adoptions roughly quadrupled during the pandemic. So there are a lot of new pet parents that are going to be trying to find care solutions for the first time. We also gained market share um, during the pandemic, which will uh, give us an opportunity to be aggressive, which is why we wanted to raise the capital. Uh, with regards to the services, uh, we've seen some interesting stuff in the data. Uh, we set a record earlier this year for daycare, which was weird for us given the lack of return to work that was taking place in April or, or March or uh, May. And so we actually are seeing examples where pet parents don't want to be away from their pets for eight hours without a human being checking in on them. So we think overall the pandemic has made us even closer um, to our furry friends. Now, Aaron, you guys talked about an area that you guys that, that you are testing, which is um, grooming. My parents, recent pet parents, cannot find a groomer inside of basically six weeks here uh, in, in the tri-state area. Have you started to ex expand that? And, and how are you um, thinking about building uh, that specific network? Because that's certainly been uh, a choke point, let's say, within the um, pet supply space. So true. So our mission as Rover is we want to make it possible for everyone to experience the unconditional love of a pet in their life. And one of the biggest reasons that people don't is actually concern over the logistics of care. What happens when I travel out of town? What happens when I go into work? I live in an apartment. I don't have a yard. Uh, taking your dog to a groomer is not easy. Uh, oftentimes they operate weekdays. 9.30 to 4.30, so we want to make that easier. And we have actually started our broader rollout across uh, the U.S., not quite nationwide yet, but we're excited about that. And we think there's an opportunity to make the grooming experience a little bit more modern and a little bit more convenient for today's pet parent. What you're seeing on the screen is a lot of the, uh, the good boys and girls of the Yahoo Finance team, a lot of puppy and kitty owners here on the team. Aaron, I do want to ask you, there has been some reports uh, of Rover and your competitor WAG uh, having some difficulty caring for pets and, and people being uh, tepid or scared to leave pets in your possession. How do you address those concerns? Um, ultimately, word of mouth and our reputations are our greatest asset. Um, but as an animal lover, like we all are at Rover, um, there is anxiety accompanied with leaving um, your child with someone new. Uh, we actually recommend that people do meet and greets. Um, we are not like Uber. We're not like DoorDash. You don't push a button. Someone gets assigned. Uh, people actually choose who they want to use to care for their pet. And about 90% of the time for first time customers, they actually go meet with them in advance. Uh, making sure it's a choice you feel comfortable with is one of the best things you can do. Um, but over time, we see that the percentage of people that have great experiences, over 95% of our stays are reviewed five stars. Um, and word of mouth is actually our biggest uh, source of customer acquisition. Um, so the reputational dynamic becomes easier over time as most people have uh, phenomenal experiences with Rover. Uh, but if you're a pet parent 
um, and you have anxiety about your pet being away from you, you're not alone. Um, we get it, and I do too. How do you screen? Uh, if I if I would were to come and work for you, how do you how would you screen me and, and do background check on me? Yeah, so when you sign up to be a sitter or service provider on Rover, whether it's a dog walker or a boarding provider or daycare provider, uh, you create a profile that includes photos, where you live. Uh, you can submit references, uh, testimonials from people whose pets you've cared for before. You then go through a background check as well. Um, the background check is intended to screen people with a criminal history that would be inappropriate for Rover. After that, you then go through a technology review where our technology looks at the traits of the profile and determines whether or not we think that person is likely to be successful. Um, and then after that, you go through a human review. And only after all that um, do you get put on uh, the site or the app. Um, and we constantly review based on feedback from customers, whether they're meets and greets or actual stays, to determine the appropriateness of people remain on the platform. Uh, trust and safety is job one for us. Aaron, how many, per how many pets do you own? <laughs> I own one incredibly high energy palm ski. So she looks like a little itty bitty husky, um, but with the tenacity of uh, a big one. <laughs> well said, definitely well said. I'll leave it there. Rover CEO Aaron Easley, good luck on your public company journey. We'll talk to you soon. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. As we've been discussing, progress being made on that infrastructure bill, a plan between Democrats and Republicans to get it across the finish line. But it has caught a new sector, or a sector that we haven't talked about much in that infrastructure bill, certainly, uh, in its crosshairs. So that would be crypto. As we're talking about a $30 billion impact here for a wide swath of the sector. And for more on the impacts from that, I want to bring on Perry Ann Boring, Chamber of Digital Commerce founder and president, joins us once again. Uh, Perry Ann, good to see you again. Uh, I mean, this is something that has a lot of people talking about maybe mitigating the impacts here just because of how broad the language is in the updated text of the bill. But talk to me about what you're finding as you dig through it and, and how big it could be here for crypto writ large. Yeah, it's estimated that the crypto provision is paying for one sixth of the entire infrastructure bill package. Um, kind of two things to clarify here. One, this is not a new tax on cryptocurrencies. This is clarifying information reporting requirements on digital assets. Bringing clarity <laughs> to these requirements is good for business. What is not good is to extend those requirements to people who have no way to comply with this. That would be miners, validators, node operators, developers, or on the technology itself. So again, regulatory clarity is a positive thing in tax in general, but this has to be done in a way that does not stifle the development and the innovation of this technology. And as this bill is written today, it could be interpreted too broad to loop in companies and people and organizations that clearly are not brokers. And that could have a pretty devastating impact on the development of this technology in the United States. What do you mean specifically by that? I mean, is it that the, the, provisions right now is way too broad, that it needs to be a little more specific, or that it needs to target the right part of, if we're talking sort of the, the crypto ecosystem overall, um, when you talk about it stifling sort of the economic growth there in this space, you know, what's your biggest concern? Yeah, our biggest concern is the definition of what a broker is. Brokers have information reporting requirements. So again, it, it is appropriate for digital currency trading platforms or traditional brokers who are dealing in digital assets to have information reporting requirements. It is not appropriate to extend those beyond those entities. Um, we have been working on multiple iterations of the language of this bill. The earliest versions that we worked on were incredibly expansive. Those have been narrowed down, but they're still not explicitly clear on node operators, miners, developers, validators, and other technical parts of the ecosystem that could not comply. So again, if you have reporting requirements on individuals or on parts of the technology, if they can't comply, it's gonna shove that 
that activity overseas. And that could have pretty huge impacts on our economy and even potentially our national security. Not only really that, but also it would kind of, you know, if you if you're kind of suggesting that this is going to be able to bring in close to thirty billion dollars, you know, and it's not possible, you're you're not going to see the pay for on the other end too. So that's not going to be a win either. Um, so, so that's probably important to consider here. But when you think about where this came from, I mean, there are some people in the crypto community. I know you've been active in pushing for maybe you know tightening the language around brokers here, uh, but there are some that are just talking about you know where this came from, potentially maybe out of nowhere uh, in getting included in the infrastructure bill this time around. Uh, what would you say to maybe the push there over the last few years to, to help Congress understand crypto and what needs to happen when you're talking about regulations that would be a win-win? Yeah, this did not come out of nowhere. The IRS commissioner testified in front of the, in front of the Senate Finance Committee back in April saying that IRS needs statutory authority to issue guidance on information reporting. Senator Portman also commented in that hearing saying that he is working on legislation on exactly that. Uh, the process of including that as a pay for in the infrastructure process is not ideal, and I, I think it's somewhat inappropriate. I do believe the cryptocurrency space is one of the most promising and fastest growing areas in our economy, and it really deserves a sophisticated and a dedica dedicated and a thoughtful public policy process. Because it was tied into the infrastructure bill, it is being rushed through a very intense legislative process, and it has not given Congress the appropriate time that is needed to take into account all of the attributes of this technology and how information reporting should and should not apply to the digital asset ecosystem. So the process is, is certainly not ideal. There's a lot of people who have been working all throughout the weekend, including us at the chamber and late into the night, just refining these definitions as much as we can. The process is not over. We have made significant amount of progress, but there is still more work to do. What's your estimation on, on how much uh, this tax can generate in terms of revenue? If we're talking roughly, what, $28 billion is what the Senate is looking at. I mean, is that a realistic number? I really wish we, we, we knew. We don't know. They have not released any information about where they came up with that in the scoring. That's an outstanding question everybody has. And the Senate should share that information with everybody so we can analyze that and better understand if that's accurate or not. We just don't know. And there's a lot of other things about this bill we just don't know because it is not clarified in the text. And lastly, Perry Ann, I mean, we've been talking a lot about kind of, you know, centralized, if you want to use the word broker since it's a catch-all, centralized entities here who are now, you know, working in the space, trying to, to do everything they can to, to be up to board. And then you got people increasingly leading into DeFi and protocols that don't really have to deal with any of this because they aren't centrally run. I wonder how, you know, the more we see regulations and taxes piled on and piled on here, what that does to maybe the push eventually into some of these decentralized uh, ways of interacting with crypto now. Yeah, again, I don't really think there's anybody pushing back on your traditional brokers having information reporting requirements. I think everybody in the industry generally agrees that they apply to brokers. If there is not an intermediary who is effectuating transactions on behalf of a customer, that is going to be an incredibly difficult thing to enforce and also for entities like decentralized exchanges or peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces to comply. The one last point that I really want to make about this bill is that there is kind of this thought that the industry is just out of compliance and that Americans who are using cryptocurrencies aren't paying their taxes. I just want to state for the record that that is a very disingenuous posture for anybody to take because there has been multiple companies who have asked for clarification of reporting and record keeping requirements for taxes and digital assets four years. Again, the problem is that this is being rushed through a legislative process and there's many important things that really need to be thought out and much more carefully considered. And this process is really jeopardizing that. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Uh, as we are uh, kind of continuing to update here, a uh, change in the CDC policy to require masks, even for vaccinated Americans in some parts uh, of the country here, when we talk about breakthrough transmissions and increasing worries around the Delta variant uh, and what that means. 
for all of us as we continue to weather the storm. And for more on that, I want to bring on a doctor who's been working on the front lines of all this for his take on where we sit. Dr. Michael Sag, University of Alabama at Birmingham, Associate Dean for Global Health, joins us once again. Uh, and Dr. Sag, good to be chatting with you uh, here today. Thanks for taking the time. I mean, when we talk about that change in policy, a lot of it does come from the risk of breakthrough transmission here for even vaccinated Americans. And what are you seeing when it comes to maybe uh, how much more concerned you are as a doctor battling now that Delta variant? Yeah, it's it's a whole new ball game again. And we're all of us, doctors, patients, people in public, we're getting whiplash, right, from all this rapid changes of information. But I think I can boil it down this way. Delta is different. Uh, we knew COVID from back last year. We talked about it a lot on this program. What's different about Delta is that it's more transmissible and it can break through the vaccine where the other variants didn't do that very much. And so here's where we are right at the moment. In, the, in Alabama, but across the country, we're going to see a spike in cases, not a surge, a spike. And we're in the middle of it right now. The spike in Alabama is going to look by Labor Day to be two to three times higher in terms of numbers of cases a day than we've ever seen in the entire epidemic, two to three times higher than our worst month, which was January of this year. And so what it means for us on the ground, we're going to have to buckle down and reorient our hospital to handle the surge in cases, the spike. The difference this go around, Zach, is that the patients coming into the hospital are almost exclusively unvaccinated people. The people who are dying, 99.2% unvaccinated people. And for me as a physician, this is a national tragedy. These deaths are largely preventable. And from a public health perspective, that's kind of inexcusable that we can be in this country and be experiencing this kind of problem. Dr. Sag, it's Akiko here. It's good to talk to you again. When you talk about that specific spike that you're anticipating around Labor Day, how much of that can be alleviated if you've got more and more Americans that are going to get vaccinated right now? Are we sort of past the point of no return when you think about a potential spike going into a surge? Or can all of this be alleviated if people say, right now, I'm going to go out and get my vaccine today? The vaccinations today, Akiko, is that that would help us for mid-September to October. Right now, for the emergency that I would call it that we're in, anyone who's unvaccinated, for goodness sakes, wear a mask, stay away from large crowds. You are at high risk of not just getting COVID, but if you got it, you're gonna end up in the hospital potentially and maybe going on a ventilator. I'm not trying to be freaking anybody out, but that's what we're seeing. And so you don't know in advance how your body's gonna deal with COVID why give it a chance? Once we get through this spike, I think the more people get vaccinated, that'll be our exit strategy. That's how we get out of this. So uh, as Jim Morrison would say, the time to hesitate is through no time to wallow in the mire. Go get vaccinated. Yeah. And, and you know, as you're kind of describing it too, Dr. Sag, I mean, now uh, when you move into the majority uh, and people who are vaccinated, those breakthrough transmissions are kind of alarming. I would fall under that camp too. Not sure if it was Delta, but but got it after being vaccinated. You think about kind of why you do it. As you said, you want to be in a better position to not go to the hospital and avoid death. So that's why you do it. Uh, but when you talk about uh, kind of what you're seeing there now, we already have Germany, uh, according to reports out there, talking about boosters for their susceptible populations. I mean, when you look at the booster discussion now to those who have been vaccinated, uh, what do you think about that? If breakthrough transmission is possible, what are you kind of advising? Well, we don't know if, that, if a booster vaccine will prevent the breakthroughs. It could. But right now, I'm most concerned, I have to triage, to the people who are unvaccinated. Because at least for the vaccinated people, you may get sick. Just like when you had a flu vaccine, you might have gotten the flu, but you typically didn't go in the hospital after being vaccinated. That's kind of where we are with COVID. So job one for all of us is to get everybody vaccinated right now, e even though it might not be uh, beneficial in the immediate next three to four weeks. It'll be hugely important for October to get us out of this. And in the meantime, the booster, yeah, we're going to get we're going to have a booster. The question is, what is it going to be? Right now, people are thinking it's just a third shot of whatever you had before, and that's a good start. But Pfizer and Moderna, maybe other companies, are developing a specific new vaccine that is 
it'll be designed to attack the Delta virus or other variants that we might see. So you might want to wait just a little bit, uh, especially if your immune system is healthy, and let's get through this surge and this spike, and we'll learn more about what a third shot does. In terms of what that booster rollout could look like, do you anticipate it will be uh, the elderly that will get it first, just like the, the first rollout of the vaccine, or um, has the Delta variant sort of changed the game on who's most vulnerable? Well, it really hadn't changed the game. It's still the, the older folks, but also people who are immunocompromised. There was an article about a week ago in the Journal of American Medical Association that showed that a third shot of the previous uh, vaccines, in other words, you got Pfizer, you got a third shot of Pfizer, uh, that it was protective for immunocompromised folks. So that's people with cancer, people who are on immunotherapy for other reasons. And those individuals have benefited uh, from that third shot. So that's the beginning of the wave. But you're exactly right, Akiko. That's going to be the people who are going to get it first. But at the same time, we don't want to keep our eye, take our eye off the ball of getting those unvaccinated people vaccinated as well. You know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can get this done, but we really have to do both over the next couple months. Yeah, Dr. Saga, I mean, I appreciate the simplicity kind of uh, of having you on and kind of just boiling it all down because it does come down to really how well we do on the vaccine front. And of course, we've known that for a while. Uh, but when it comes to now, right, where we're at, you know, you look at scenes like Lollapalooza, it, it's it's weird because you think about the backlash of some of these things, but but they were potentially doing it the right way, looking into vaccine passports or, or testing negative. I mean, as we try and move past this, if you are vaccinated, the people who have done everything right, who have followed all the orders along the way to, to get to this point now, I mean, how do you look at the right way to do it and hosting opening back up? Is there still a need maybe for vaccine passports and requiring people to maybe avoid uh, large gatherings still? Yeah, I had a lot of sympathy for people at Lollapalooza and especially the organizers because based on May, June experience, that was a great idea to have the festival in the first place. And then Delta showed up on really July 4th, and that was a spark that ignited this wildfire that we're in right now. And we're suffering pretty mightily at the moment. Um, we learned from Provincetown, that study that CDC put out this week or last week, um, Provincetown, 75 percent of the people who got infected were vaccinated. And we also learned that vaccinated people can transmit to other vaccinated people. But the bottom line is that vaccinated people don't tend to get very sick and they don't end up in the hospital and they don't die. So it's kind of a mixed message. It makes it very hard for all of us. Uh, you guys telling the story, us being interviewed about it, to try to bring out these nuances that the vaccine is paramount. But in the meantime, while we're experiencing this surge of cases, a spike, we all have to sort of take one step back and at least be aware that we're not completely safe. Before, again, two months ago, I would have said, you get your vaccine, it's like having a biologic mask. I still believe that. Um, for the other variants, for Delta, it's different. And lastly, Dr. Sag, I mean, just when you look at kind of the, the doctors you're working with and the front lines preparing for potentially another wave there, as you're describing it, I mean, what's the morale? How's it been kind of going through this as a doctor here and having to witness what you witness and you think about the position we're in in this country? Yeah, Zach, I just uh, had a op-ed in the Washington Post uh, the end of last week that addresses that head on. I, I called it pre-traumatic stress disorder. So we're trying to gear up for our, if you will, third tour of duty in a war zone. So I, I didn't serve in the military, but I can certainly imagine what it was like for a serviceman or woman to have fought their tour of duty, gone home, gone back, and now we're going back again. That's what it feels like. Healthcare workers are exhausted, worn out, frustrated, angry that people aren't getting vaccinated. And those are precisely the people who are showing up in our ERs and being admitted to the hospital, being transferred to the ICUs. And here we go again, dealing with death. And we don't like it, but the healthcare workers are professional. They'll rise up, they'll do the job, but it's very demoralizing to your point. And we just got to support one another. And above all, what the public can do is get vaccinated. And if you've been vaccinated, please encourage those around you. You can make a difference simply by having a positive message and getting your friends and relatives vaccinated, even if they're hesitant.